Check, check. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you again. Welcome to the low residency, high intensity, <laughs> high integrity, high visibility MFA visual studies lecture series. I'm Ryan Pierce. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that PNCA is located on the unceded traditional land of the Multnomah, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, other bands of Chinook, other tribes. And I encourage you to spend some time in the commons area viewing the Arrowhead Project throughout this building, which is a collection of work by contemporary indigenous artists addressing the history of this place pre and post colonization and the shortcomings of land acknowledgements in a very humorous way and showcasing the vibrant complexity of present day Native American artists and communities. It's a joy and an honor to host my friend and co-conspirator, Julie Perini. We met here at PNCA when we were both adjuncts in maybe 2009. And since then, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Julie on art, activism, and wilderness projects. She's an artist who continues to surprise me with her ethical integrity, creative discipline, and quirky humor. In her ongoing found footage video collage work, they have a name for girls like me, Julie has spliced dozens of films to remove all footage, save for instances of characters saying the name Julie. You'll see it. It's a hilarious and hypnotic way to reflect on how our names are and are not ourselves, the mutability of identity, and the many selves that we as artists contain. Within Julie's practice, I'm particularly intrigued by the breadth spanning her documentary work, and her introspective, quiet, wondrous, diaristic minute movies. And perhaps we'll get to hear about that breath tonight. Julie is also a committed educator here in Portland and beyond, is an aficionado of diners and saunas, a writer of creative nonfiction, a soft pornographer, a wilderness guide, <laughs> and a brilliant artist, please join me in welcoming Julie Perini. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Ryan. That is an introduction I will not soon forget. That was, that was the first time, maybe of more times, I'll be introduced as a soft pornographer thing. That was new, you know. Um, we'll touch on all that later. Um, Oh my gosh, thank you just to everyone, to PNCA, to the students, so many friends and collaborators are here tonight. So uh, this talk is gonna reference lots of stuff I've made with people here in the front row. So maybe they can come up and talk. How about that? Um, so <laughs> um, I put together a whole new talk. I mean, I feel like we're in a new world in a lot of ways, or I feel like I am anyway in the last few years. So when I was looking back at artist talks I've done, um, a lot of them just kind of start at like, whatever, like 2007, and they're like, that's when my life began, when I started making art, and here's an art, and here's another art, and here's another art. But so many things I've been thinking about lately have to do with how, um, you know, I wouldn't be making now what I'm making if it weren't for all kinds of stuff that happened to me in those years before that, you know? And then really before I was even born, you know? A lot of things have come together to shape who I am and what I'm making and what I'm interested in and what I'm able to do and all that kind of stuff. So that's why the word ancestors in there. I'm not actually gonna go too deep into that, but it is something that I'm thinking about a lot and one revision to this talk from other talks is that there's a lot of references to like teachers I've had, friends I've had, influences, that kind of stuff. Because I feel like I used to not do that. I used to pretend like everything came from me and <laughs> I was so awesome. And um, But I think it's uh, more appropriate for me to reference all the different people and movements and places and other ideas that have shaped what I do. So, And then the other things, time and archives, are kind of some of the big things I want to talk a lot about today, because uh, that's some of the newest work I'm doing. So, so a lot of the stuff I'll show is very, is not done, actually. <laughs> so, um, uh, But I'm excited to have a conversation with folks about that new in-progress stuff. Um, go, so talking about ancestors, the first thing I wanted to say is 
I made this pink timeline. So throughout the talk, you're gonna see it fill in with important dates in my personal history. And um, the first thing I was thinking though, I was saying, you know, there's a lot that came together before me even happened in this world. So one thing I think about is, um, you know, the beginning of the world and how if you believe in the fact that there's creation and evolution and stuff like that, if you believe in evolution, then, um, you know, we all go back to these earliest life forms, these single-celled organisms, you know? Like, these cute little creatures are like all of us, you know? They're kind of still swimming around in us. Uh, so for some reason, when I heard about this idea on a podcast I referenced there, I found this enormously comforting, you know, to think that um, I could identify, because maybe I don't know a lot about some of my more recent ancestors and stuff, but the idea that I could go back that far and kind of connect in that way was, um, I don't know, somehow grounding. And the idea that I'm gonna return to that too, you know, like I'm gonna totally dissolve and go back to the soup eventually, you know. And so also some people believe that some of the earliest life began in hot springs, so that's why that's in here. I mean, first there were old rocks, you know, which we are also connected to really because those minerals mixed with water, some say, in like thermal vents in oceans and other places where there's hot springs, and that's where life kind of erupted from the energy and stuff. And so when I'm sitting in a hot spring these days, which I do whenever I can, I'm just thinking about that too, you know, that that is sort of a place where uh, new things can start and stuff. And so we'll come back to hot springs later, but um, maybe you see a little bit of yourself in one of these creatures here, maybe, I don't know. Um, so, so that was a long time ago. That was millions of years ago. More recently, hundreds of years ago, say, uh, they, we think, you know, I haven't actually done all of those DNA tests and stuff, but I have, you know, biological ancestors who were roaming around in what is now Ireland and Italy, we think, and in the 30s, that's when my grandparents came over here separately, they didn't know each other, from Ireland and Italy to New York, and that's where my parents met and moved to the suburbs of Poughkeepsie. I'm kind of like put all my notes up here. I'm not going to say everything on all these things. It's just sort of a multimedia way for you to get information. You can sort of read and sort of listen. And um, But so, and uh, in 1977, that's when I was born. And I, like I say here, shared that experience with my twin brother who was also born right around that time. Um, and <laughs> um, so, you know, and we, so I grew up in this place called Poughkeepsie, New York, which is on the Hudson River outside New York City. Um, connected at that time to this like very extended Italian immigrant family, you know? And so I grew up hearing Italian and eating Parmesan cheese and all that stuff. And so, um, but was in a very like, you know, American suburban kind of world. And so uh, where, you know, I went to high school and felt like, uh, I've mentioned some stuff here, like just some early artistic influences. I don't come from an artistic family at all. Um, we didn't, I didn't grow up hearing like music or anything like that. But, you know, school was a place where I got connected to that kind of stuff and uh, got really into music, playing music. I played clarinet in the marching band and everywhere else I could. And then, um, but also I learned at that time about like independent music that was happening around the country and beyond. And so that really blew my mind. The fact that like people were making music in their garages and making recordings and passing it around and learning about stuff through zines. Like this was a big deal in the 90s. For me, maybe some of you can identify with this, like uh, especially like learning about music in a way where it was all about getting notes right and all that kind of stuff in this kind of way you do at school to learn that you could just go play an instrument in the basement and see what happened and maybe it actually sounded more like what you want music to sound like, you know, maybe it felt more authentic to who you are was a mind-blowing thing. So, um, I just mentioned, like I said here, and then I also went to college and uh, at Cornell University, and there's a few college chums here. Some of my oldest friends are in the audience right now. Um, and uh, got my mind blown just learning about more things. Like, I had never seen an experimental film before. Video art in the 90s was actually kind of still like, you know, an evolving art form. And so I had teachers who shared that kind of stuff with me, and it really blew my mind. And so. I want to show you a kind of cringy video that is um, representative of what I was like doing at the time. Like, 
Oh, I forgot to mention, backing up in high school, I found a, you know, my parents had a big VHS camcorder. I mean, an artist talk by me is kind of also a walk through like media history, you know? And so at the time in the 90s, they had this camcorder that had like, I'm gonna step over here, like, a VCR basically attached to your hip, you know, and then the camera was here and you kind of would, you know, film stuff. So I would use that in high school to make stuff with my friends is why I bring this up. So this began what is like still 100% happening today, like this like sort of way of being in the world, which is like, what can I do with me and a camera and wherever I am, you know, like, and so what I did in the 90s here was this, which, So yeah, I mean, I was always just making stuff like that where something, oh, <laughs> you don't have to clap at that, <laughs> but thanks everybody. I just, I just felt compelled to share like a vulnerable chair, I guess, you know, like this was not made as like art, like, but this was made like, I, at the time I always made, something was always off, you know? with whoever these characters were that I was performing in these things. And so I think I had a very vexed relationship to food at the time, and, you know, so it wasn't too weird that, like, stuff was always coming out of people's bodies in films I made. I should probably try to dig those ones up. I was really into horror at the time. So anyway, but like I said, that basic principle of, like, playing around the house with the camera is still what I do. Um, we're moving ahead in time. Look at this. Here we go. Um, here's some important dates. Um, in the early 2000s, I lived in New York City. Uh, I had some adventures in Alaska, and I, which is another story, but um, there's a lot of stories. There's so many stories I could tell you, but I'm trying to figure out the most important ones to tell you live here on the spot. I chalked this to fill up too many stories, but I'll try to figure it out. Um, I went to graduate school. Uh, I got an MFA in media study, it's called, from the University at Buffalo, which is where they at the time and still do uh, focus on like experimental media. They do everything there. They do VR and computer stuff and all kinds of stuff. And so um, while I went there, I mean, for a million reasons, I mean, I'm very aware that I'm talking to a crowd of people who are in MFA school right now. So it's partly why I was reflecting on that a bit, that time period in my life. Um, it was a time where, you know, I had gone to undergrad and not learned how to make videos or films too much. Like I did stuff all on my own. I learned at like public access how to edit videos and stuff. And so I still wanted to learn how to make things, although in grad school they didn't actually show me there either, you know, but I don't know if that's happening here. But it wasn't very skills based, you know, and that's okay. I mean, it blew my mind in a lot of other ways. Um, and so I put some names of a couple works that I'm going to share with you up there, but most of them I'm not going to share with you. We're going to move on to more recent stuff. But um, just mentioning, again, lots of people who are my teachers or um, friends or things I was, like, you know, learning about at the time. Um, one important story, I guess, is... Um, the reason there's this stuff here called, this is coming to court, and there's a subpoena up here. This is kind of a, one of the, you know, when you look back at your life, there's often these turning point moments, you know, and sometimes they're kind of things that maybe you weren't aware of at the time, you just kind of went along with like, well, I have to move somewhere, or I'm doing that, you know, but uh, other times there's really big ones where it's like your whole life is before and after that moment. And this is one of those times for me, which is when uh, I was in graduate school in 2004, that was after the first year, um, one of my professors was, uh, became under investigation for being a bioterrorist. I don't know if Ryan mentioned this to your, you all. Okay. Um, the quick story is that... Um, <laughs> is that it was a post 
September 11th um, war on terror kind of world we were living in in the United States at the time. And so there were a lot of people who were under investigation by the FBI for being terrorists, you know, um, all kinds of people who were absolutely not terrorists, who were just uh, suspicious to them for some reason. And so this, so this happened, though, where a... Um, uh, my professor's wife passed away. They were 45 years old and in her sleep from heart failure. And he called 911 and emergency people came over and they saw all these Petri dishes and uh, microscopes and stuff that like, why would an individual citizen have this kind of questions uh, entered the minds of these emergency personnel. And um, it's because he was an artist who was doing artwork at the time, like performance projects and participatory performances about um, genetic modification, GMOs, you know, which is like now like something that is very normalized. But at the time, it was like sounding the alarm, like, did you know your food is genetically modified? You know, this is like 2004. So he was doing performances, try to raise awareness. So they had that kind of stuff around the house for their projects. And so he was part of a collective called Critical Art Ensemble. This is Steve Kurtz. And so, um, for whatever reason, uh, or not, I, I know what the reason, I got roped into this investigation. I was living in uh, Alaska. I mentioned I had a, uh, adventures in Alaska in the summers. And so I was there for the summer after my first year of grad school. And, um, and how did I first, an FBI agent like came to the door of my house I was living at and was like, um, you know, saying they had a subpoena and they wanted me to appear at court because they thought I could answer questions about this case, you know. And so, um, and I had never interacted with like federal law enforcement before. I'd barely interacted with uh, local law enforcement. I like egged someone's house in high school and stuff, you know. And so, um, but uh, he totally deserved it. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and um, but you know, and so, uh, but at, so I um, ended up having to fly back to Buffalo that summer. Like I was supposed to like stay in Alaska and wait tables and do what I was doing, make money for school and stuff. But I ended up flying back and testifying in court and just kind of getting um, a good... And the reason I say he was under investigation for being a bioterrorist is because that's eventually what the government thought he was doing with this stuff, you know? Even, even though there's much, much evidence that, to the contrary, that this is someone who's, like, promoting peace and awareness and community and connection. Um, but so I had to testify in front of a grand jury about what I knew about him. Did he have a secret lab somewhere? Did I read his books? Like it was very thought policey and you know, but this lasted a few years and then eventually they uh, threw the case out, but he still ended up, um, yeah, they eventually threw the case out. So I'll just stop there. There's a lot, a lot of details there. Um, but this really, you know, uh, shook me up a lot. You know, I was 25, 26. My whole community was pretty shook up in Buffalo, all the artists and professors I was hanging around with. Uh, everybody's mail was getting read. Everybody was getting called by the FBI. And every, people were testifying or not getting lawyers. Like, it was just this whole new world. So I'm, I'm trying to write a memoir about this. I'm into creative writing now a lot, too. And so I've written, like, I don't know, 30 pages of a book about this um, and so anyway I just bring that up because it was an important life moment and he's okay you know but um, uh, yeah like the, I got to witness like a lot of artists rallying around him at the time tra trying to raise money for legal fees I just got to see what that was like on a local and inner even international scale you know um, so we could you can ask more about that later if you want but what this means is, you know, I was making artwork that was kind of growing off of what you saw with the little, like, 90s video of stuff coming out of my mouth, you know. I was still doing stuff that was very uh, much about private moments and how to connect my private moments to other people and stuff like that. And so... Um, I ended up doing this as my graduate thesis project. I'm kind of bringing it back just because it's kind of similar to what I'm doing nowadays. But um, I did, I'll just let these videos play. But I remember thinking at the time, like, I should be doing something more political, even though I was doing a lot of, like, activist stuff outside of artworks. Like, I couldn't figure out how to bring the activist stuff together with art stuff I was doing at the time. I did, like, I 
put on a huge like awareness raising conference and went and spoke whenever I could about Steve's case and was trying to keep him out of prison. This became my mission in graduate school. <laughs> I stopped caring if professors liked me or my art. <laughs> Instead, it became about trying to help somebody uh, out. And so, um, but I decided to do this project where um, I would shoot videos uh, as much as I could during my daily life. And also, if I ever got a feeling where something sort of scared me, like an idea to do something, but something was stopping me, I thought I should try to push past that and still do it, you know? So like this video comes from that impulse. And I was thinking about this because I had learned so much about um, radical social movements from the past uh, because of this case, because I was trying to connect what happened to Steve and our community to like other instances of FBI. Um, involvement or disruption of radical social movements or any kind of social movement. And so I kind of went on my own research project trying to learn about that history. And so I thought, well, I can, if people can do the like, all the things they've done in the past, I can certainly do something like this. Like if I, I had this thought that what if I went and danced everywhere I landed that one day, every car I get out of and go to a parking lot or whatever, I'll dance for a second and then keep going. I just was like, should I do that? I'm scared to do that, but then I decided to do it. And the uh, result is this. So, and that also became a kind of uh, challenge to figure out how to edit that. Like, I had all these shots that were a couple minutes long of these little dances, and when I watched them, I didn't think they were nearly as thrilling as it had been to actually do the thing, you know? And so I was like, you know, I ended up like working on this forever, trying to get to this point where it seemed to communicate something of what it felt like to do the activity, you know? And so, um, but then along with that, I wasn't just making the videos, I also did this. that's it because you know I had grown up in high school learning about like um, there were all these record of the month clubs and stuff that a lot of independent music was being produced and distributed that way and I totally I, the mail was a big way I received culture you know <laughs> and so um, it made sense I guess at the time to distribute culture that way too um, 
so again, I told you it's going to be kind of a tour through media art history, like that monitor in the back, just a DVD at all, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, and just the way that when I watch these things, now I just see like, um, uh, you know, YouTube or other kinds of social media challenges and stuff like that. What's the, what's the social media? I'm blanking on what it's called. Yeah, a TikTok thing, you know? Like I'm like, but I did this a long time ago. Um, so this is going to happen. Now that we're getting where there's a million videos on a page and stuff. Sorry. I'm going to just... Ah. So this is going to happen to just... I put a lot of things on each page, and I don't necessarily want to show them all, but we can come back to them maybe. Um, so there may be moments like that. Uh, this is a film that... Ryan mentioned. Um, around that time, I was really into this uh, VHS tape I had of the film Valley Girl, and it has this character named Julie in it. Uh, Valley Girl stars Nicolas Cage. He's, it's like a Romeo and Juliet story. He's this punk, and she's this Valley Girl, and um, but she was named Julie. And then I found out a couple other films that also had Julie characters, and then I I'll just let Ryan told you about it. Um, it's now like 43, 45 minutes long. It's, that's, so it's a lot of Julie films now. Um, but here's just the beginning of it. song about Julie too. But uh, when I've shown this in a gallery setting, I made these large scale prints that, or maybe you can kind of see, uh, these are all different Julies and usually Julie, because most women in film have a sort of a romantic object in some, or are the object of some romantic situation usually. And so um, these are like Julies and the, usually the partner person. And so um, that top one is a nudist film with a Julie character. That's why you saw those people, or naturist, they call it actually, um, that I got here at Movie Madness. A lot of these films came from Movie Madness because they have this amazing collection of like B movies and stuff. Um, so these are like 36 by 24 prints. Um, and to me, I think of these as like extreme slow motion. I've done a lot with these. I'm, I haven't put a lot in this presentation about these, but I've done, I've made other large scale prints like this using film frames. And I kind of want to make more um, where, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Um, moving on in time, 2010s, we're getting more recent. Uh, so Things happened in my life. I ended up uh, getting a job at Portland State University where I teach now in their art school. And I've just stayed in Portland the whole time. Before this, I was like moving around a lot. So, um, and this is where, you know, because of this experience I'd had uh, in Buffalo with the FBI and kind of learning a lot about um, social movement histories and so on, I came here and really wanted to be around other people who kind of cared about things like state repression. Um, and uh, so I ended up getting kind of connected to a lot of police and pri prison abolition folks in Portland. This was earlier too, like 2007, eight, nine. And, um, uh, you know, for a long time, like I said, I was just sort of only just doing what, um, you know, activists needed to do. I wasn't making art about it. I was kind of just learning about these movements that were happening today, figuring out how I could connect with them, just doing whatever people needed, like people showing up to flyer for things or showing up to protest. Um, and so, and yeah, and I just made the connection between, 
you know, police and prisons to what my experience was, because, you know, I was like, oh, I felt very shook up by this FBI thing. But there's people who are experiencing this kind of harassment by law enforcement every single day on the street just because of who they are. And so, um, so I kind of quickly made that connection and was like, well, I'm going to get involved with this stuff. Um, and so, um, like, critical resistance at the time was a newer thing in the early, you know, mid-2000s. And so... Um, but I was also doing other art experiments too, video, media, art stuff. And so I wanted to share with you a little bit of that and then we'll get into like the documentaries and things and wrap up with some of what I'm doing now. Um, uh, I'll just mention briefly, you know, I made these, I got into making what I call handmade film, like using 16 millimeter or eight millimeter film and either painting on it, scratching on it, burying it in the ground, seeing what happens and hearing things to it. You can do anything you want to film and to the surface. People call it cam cameraless films or direct animation. And so um, I made lots of films with those techniques. This one is one that was buried in the ground for a few weeks and every day I took out a little bit of it so that it degrades more and more over the minute or so that you see it. So you're kind of seeing that there. So things like this were kind of experiments. There were things that involved time. Like I loved that I got to pull this out every day and see how it was doing. That's kind of what you see down here. Eventually I like the big grid of film frames you saw. Like I started to make stuff like this, like these sculptural things. Like these are frames of this film here, like blown up really big, and then made into these film strips that were in a gallery installation like this. Um, oh, and this is also 2011. I'll let this play without sound. When I started making daily videos. Um, it was a time when I was like hustling a lot, like working several, teaching at like three different schools and I felt like I never had time for my own artwork. And I decided, and I was just busy trying to like meet people and find places to live and all that kind of stuff in Portland in the early 2000s or 2010s. And I said, I must have time to make one one minute a day to be an artist. I'm supposed to be an artist, I wanna be an artist. So I said, I must have a minute a day where I can dip into my creative self and make something, anything, you know? And so I bought that special flip camera, which became the camera I was gonna use. Cause at the time in 2011 even, cameras, phones had cameras, but they weren't that great, you know? Um, and even a little flip camera was actually better than what phones had and so, I just, like, that was the only rule. 30, 60 seconds, uninterrupted, that's all it has to be. And so, and I had no expectation for what it was even. It was just a chance to look around or a chance to perform for the camera or something like that. So, but this continues to this day. This is now, like, the main thing I'm working on. And occasionally over the years, I would dip into that archive of, of daily videos and, uh, make a diary film or something else out of them or use them as inspiration for things that eventually got incorporated into these like uh, high definition feature film things. Um, like that's true of this film. Like there's at least one shot that I think we kind of was something I had shot in my own daily life like um, and uh, recreated it in HD for this film, for this one. One of the things where the camera's like on the ground, I'm talking to Jody and Aaron who made the film with me. I'm like, did I ever tell you that? Um, and so, um, but eventually, um, I, after working with um, police and prison activists for a long time, I, one thing led to another and I was talking with some activists and we were like, let's make media that will help folks learn about the situation of police violence in Portland. And so, um, and you know, content warning for folks, this film, this project and maybe a couple others coming up do have to deal with, um, you know, some violence, racial violence, police violence, stuff like that. And so, um, so take care of yourselves, everybody. Um, but so we wanted to get people talking about this more at the time. This is in 2011, I think. And I felt like, well, I know how to make media. Maybe I can help you all do this. And so I, um, anyway, eventually we thought we would make a series of short videos that people could uh, use at gatherings and share like, well, we are just going to share these few about this topic or these few. But eventually, many years ago, you know, this, this project actually was at least like four or five years in the making. Um, 
years, a couple years go by, and eventually Aaron and Jody, who are here, thank you so much, uh, came on board this project, and we became a real collaborative team, jamming, making this project. They had decades of experience in the independent media and activist communities in town, and so, um, so they could really connect with a lot of people, had lots of experience doing interviewing, and so we ended up making this film that looks uh, about at the history, maybe like 40, 50 years in the past from early 2010s um, of uh, instances of police violence in Portland and also all the ways that people have resisted it. People have pushed back. People have said, this is not going to happen here. And so um, including profiling groups at the time who were really active. So to sh show you, I guess I kind of don't have tons of time. Um, Maybe I'll kind of talk over it. Um, maybe I'll just mention one thing here if this loads quickly. You know, we did, I did some of that same film scratching stuff. Since it's right in the beginning, I'll just show you. But um, where we, I went to some of the sites where stuff had happened, where people had lost their lives. And uh, I can't find it. Chinese food. I'm sorry, it's not here right now, and did these kind of um, film rubbings that got incorporated into the film as what we called interstitials. Um, they're not coming up quickly, sorry about that. But I'll just say, since we don't have tons of time for all this, you can watch this online, of course. And there's lots of archival resources that we brought into this. Uh, we did a lot of original interviews with community leaders. Um, I don't have time to talk about everything today. I knew this might happen. I chalked it full of like all my life story. Um, but the same is true of this one. We won't really have time to look at this. But also around that time, um, I was working with, uh, I was at a prison abolition conference and met Bo Brown. And she is someone who had been a member of something called the George Jackson Brigade, which in the early 70s was a group that was uh, living underground, like people were living under assumed names and identities, and they were carrying out actions, kind of like the Weather Underground, maybe you've heard of them. Um, and they were carrying out actions in solidarity with you know, striking workers or um, anti-imperialist movements in other countries even, or just all every kind of different sort of um, movement happening at the time. They were, you know, blowing up buildings. They were doing really violent things to try to call attention to all these things. And so she was a really interesting person. And I um, spent many, a couple of years, over a few days at a time, over a couple of years, interviewing her and her collaborators. Um, I'll let They're them cozy, say this. Cuddly, armed and dangerous, and we will raise the fucking prisoners to the ground. We are cozy and cuddly armed and dangerous, and we'll raise the fucking prisons to the ground. These are George Jackson Brigade members. The George Jackson Brigade was an armed struggle group, one of many. That so it's mostly about Bo, but it really gets into her. Um, she passed away not long ago, and we made this poster to honor her. We are cozy. Ah. OK, but here we are in the present. Um, I'll just mention some of the things I'm working on now, and hopefully we can talk about that or anything else. Um, and so, uh, you know, we're not gonna have time to look at everything. Just wanted to mention that um, I have also been making films with my partner, John, who's in the audience, and we made this film here. This is the one Ryan mentioned earlier, <laughs> maybe, uh, called Scamper in the Camper, which is also a, um, um, film where we shot it on 60 millimeter, we processed it by hand ourselves, we uh, manipulated it, you know, drew on it, painted on it, and then edited it together, like all in, you know, one go, kind of. Um, I would say all in one week, except we tried to do that, and then we had to do it like months later, too. But um, so, so still, I still have a hand in that, and I love working collaboratively with people, and so I do so much stuff that's totally alone, making little videos by myself, but I really crave also working, connecting with people in that way, and so John is someone I've worked with, Aaron and Jody I've worked with a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, just to mention the maybe two projects that I'm working on these days that are very much deep into this like idea of archives and you know also time in a lot of ways. Um, let's look at these, and then we'll just talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, this one, maybe I think Ryan probably mentioned to some of you. Um, this is a project called It Did Happen Here, which um, 
started out as a podcast. I was not the original podcast initiator. Aaron Yankee, Mike Crenshaw, Selena, a couple other people were. Um, but during the pandemic, when this podcast was coming out, I uh, jumped on board to help out with social media. I wanted to get the word out about this project I thought was really awesome. And so um, it tells the story of the 90s in Portland when there were kind of, um, it's, it's very relevant to what's happening these days, where there were white nationalist groups who were kind of coming to town and, or even embedded in the town's, you know, community. And there were, um, you know, anti-racist groups in the punk community and activist communities who were fighting back against this. And so they all came together to, uh, you know, try to get these folks out of town. And so it's a deep story that has like more than like three dozen or more interviews in it. The podcast is fantastic. At some point, the uh, publisher PM Press asked if we wanted to, now I'm saying we, at the time I felt like I was just a helper, you know, but then uh, they asked if they wanted to make it into a book, like an oral history, like take all of this material you have and make it into a book. And so that's when Aaron brought me more on board and was like, why don't you come in and do more um, archival research for images to include in the book? And I came on and edited the thing too with everybody. And so I feel a little bit more, a lot more, like an actual author contributor now after working for a year or something on getting the book together. Um, and so, but I think it's also good maybe as for everyone to see, like not every project has to be like, my project, you know, <laughs> like it is okay to like be the support person on someone else's great project, you know, <laughs> and so uh, that's kind of how I felt about this. And I also always do want to have a foot in these kind of community based media projects that are preserving and communicating, com you know, community history stuff that's otherwise not preserved very many places, you know, and so, um, so yeah, like I say here, I talk to a lot of you know, punks from the time asked what they had in their what they had in their personal archives. They have lots of great stuff like these photos here. Um, but also, Aaron and I went to so many actual archives. You know, like um, in town and beyond. Uh, the University of Oregon, a place called the Rural Organizing Project. This is us doing that kind of stuff. This is you know using real, getting real stuff. You know, like we could do some Google searches for stuff, but really a lot of this stuff has not been digitized that way. And so this is very like original sort of research we were doing. And a lot of this made its way into the book. Not all of it. We scanned like so much stuff. <laughs> um, so that happened over yeah like a year or two there where we were doing that kind of work. So. The book is here. If folks are interested in learning about this anti-fascist people's history, um, we can sell it to you for uh, $15, you know? Like, uh, the list price is 22 but we can sell it to you for less. So please let me know. It's, it's uh, fantastic. So, and just to mention a little bit more about this other thing, you know, that's the kind of uh, community kind of things. The things I'm do this doing now uh, related to the Minute Movies work is this is where I've been like very deep in for the past two years. Um, at some point, you know, a couple years ago, I was like, why don't I take this back burner project? Because I mean, I kept making videos every day forever, you know, from 2011. It was always just became the most fun part of my day. If I had time waiting for the bus, I was suddenly excited because it meant I could make a video, you know, it just gave me time to um, reflect and be be more present where I was really and so I was like let's see what this is in this archive and make something out of it you know I just would always dump it into a hard drive and that was it I never I just labeled everything with the date and that was it so I ended up um, okay, because oh no I could add I ended up um, we're not gonna watch all these but this is kind of good because it shows you the database. So I have an assistant, Max, who I want to reference there. I'm going to turn Julie down for a second. And um, Max and I, uh, what, what I wanted to do was watch everything and then catalog it somehow so that I could eventually search it and make something from it, right? And so, because it's thousands of shots, like it's at least one a day for whatever it is, 10, 12 years now. So we're up to like thousands, you know? And so I eventually Oh, wait, this isn't the one I wanted to show you. Oh, I made this big for a reason. Here. Um, so I made a custom database. And maybe you all want to do this with some of your, like, digital, like, clutter also. You know, <laughs> it's like um, I made this database, which I'm going to show you a little bit more of, 
where I go through every single shot and make a record for each one. And I have, I made different like fields for making notes basically. Like what is happening and what's the sound? Are there colors in the shot? Like different just stuff you can see on the surface. But then I also made space for notes about what's going on, other people in the shot. And I had another field at the end that's uh, how does this make me feel now? <laughs> and I have these pull down menus of, um, which I'll, I want to show you all this stuff, these pull down menus that tell you about that. Um, so, okay, how do I advance a page? Okay, like this. And how do I make it giant again? Thanks. Yeah, and so this is what this database looks like. It's using Airtable software. Thank you so much. Uh, and I wanted to show you those other videos of Max, the person who was my assistant collaborator on this, because um, what they did, their job was just to find a thumbnail for each one, but they are the only other person besides me who will ever have watched all of these. I just really wanted a thumbnail and felt like it would be a task that would kind of slow me down, like I could see myself getting sort of finding it tedious and then walking away or something. And also I wanted accountability, like I wanted to have someone I meet every week and I'm just like, you know, okay, did we get through 100 shots? Did we do that, you know? And so, um, so I just was on this like real journey the past two years with Max where we met over Zoom, like you saw, and often recorded the talks. And um, I'll show you more looks at this. And like, here's an example of what it looks like to make an entry and stuff, you know? So yeah, I'll just leave that up. And um, yeah, so Max and I would meet. And then Max started to make Max's own Max noticings, they called it, like this huge spreadsheet full of notes because they just, you know, their job was only to make a thumbnail, but then they got into it and wanted to say, like, Julie, you seem like you're more bold in this month. You're doing stuff on the bus or you're doing this and that. And so, um, so they became really integral to the project. Like, we just had a sort of ceremonial final uh, celebration where, because we both got through 10 years of shots. And um, we went out to my father's place, the diner, and had, like, something fried, I think, and uh, partied, you know? Um, but anyway, so this was what I was focused on for years. It became an endurance project, more, not quite years, maybe a year and a half, where any time I had free studio time, I was like, I got to get through three months. I got to get through 100 shots. You know, it became a real discipline thing. And it was partly joyful because I loved opening up these like time capsules, like what is going to be in this month? I don't know. Like I don't remember what I was shooting 10 years ago and stuff. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it was really hard because it was full of grief, you know, <laughs> like people are no longer with us or going through a really hard, or some things reminded me of hard times and I literally couldn't always keep working. I'd have to stop and go for a walk and just take care of myself. Um, but yeah, so to show you a little bit more here. So these things, if you really want to get into it, um, these are these drop down menus I started making where um, yeah, where I was getting this really long list of feelings words, and I was getting this really long list of subjects. I mean, they're longer now. I made this like a year ago. I was always just adding to this. And so, but so many of them are like stuff like you're seeing here, like, um, you know, I got really into the fine distinctions between engrossed and absorbed and fascinated <laughs> and enchanted and, you know, like, because so many actually fit that for me, you know. So many, so often, what I was stopping to do was look at something that I thought was really amazing or beautiful. Like, there's so many shots of like moving water and fountains and nature and other things. Though, um, so and most of these are representing solitary experiences. I think a lot of people, if they did this project, it might have maybe more people in it, you know? And some of them do, but a lot of them are very much just like when I have a moment to be alone and look around. Um, and I've done lots of research on other far artists who do this kind of stuff. Jonas Mikis is a filmmaker who um, lived in New York City and is like made these massive diary films, like three or four year, uh, hours long. And I love this chart. If you can see what's going on here, this is the date, 1945, up to like whatever this is, 86. 
And then up here is this when he filmed stuff, when he edited it. So you can see like his first film, Walled In. He shot it here, 1965, and then till here, and started editing it while he was still shooting it. Others, it's like this old material that he edited down here. Others, it's like this one was shot and edited not too far apart from each other. You see what this chart is doing? When I saw this, it blew my mind because I'm working with the, this scale too, like 10 decades long projects now. And so, um, so this sort of helped me think about this and also made me realize I am probably just gonna be doing this for the rest of my life, I think, you know? And so I'm pretty sure. So I love it, why would I stop? Um, so, but I, and maybe I'll get faster. Maybe I'll become like him where I shoot stuff and then two years later edit it instead of 10 years later edit it. Um, and I've done a lot of research into, you know, people like this, people who do personal filmmaking, things like this, and this kind of stuff. When I read this, I was like, this person just knows exactly what I'm thinking, you know? Um, things like this, like the film diaries twice in the present, because this is how it feels for me. It's about being very present with the moment, with the video, and then later being present again and being like, well, what's the truth of this now? You know, that's why I had this category of, well, how does it make me feel? I can't remember exactly, you know, I'll never know, but I can see what comes up now. Um, and also this idea of taking notes, because that's very much what this process feels like it's become, like a little notebook, you know? Um, I'll, we're gonna wrap up. There's, there's lots of people who do diary stuff. I could talk about diaries all day and actually considered it for just this talk. Instead, I'll just show you what it looks like, because sometimes I talk too much about it and don't actually show people what it looks like. But a lot of the shots I've shot like, look like this, okay? So, you know, from a train, looking down at water, sometimes performing for a camera. These are just clips of it. They're all at least a minute long. Um, and, you know, this is like filling up the frame to change it. This is an older one. Um, I end up seeing a lot of like similar compositions come up, uh, which is never really intentional, but it's kind of just, I guess, learning how I like to look at the world, you know? <laughs> um, diners, Ryan mentions, go to those a lot, alone. I do a lot of things alone. Um, let's see. Oh, and then a big change we saw in going through the archive over the last year or so was when the iPhone hits the scene for me. Like, the iPhone was getting better and better, but I was loving on my flip camera forever. I liked having a separate camera. It was, like, sacred. I would fish it out of the bag, and that would be the moment I have with my minute movie. But eventually, I decided to try, become, you know, like... Like, just do what everyone's doing and shoot video in your iPhone. It's great, you know? And so I've started doing that. That's what I've done since 2018. And I do like the wider frame and higher resolution. It's nice, you know? Uh, but it was a big shift. Like, the, I'd been composing for this small standard definition 4x3 frame forever. And then to switch over to 16.9 was a really big thing. And still is, actually. I like 4.3 better, <laughs> so I think I'm gonna, I actually changed my iPhone to shoot in 4.3 now, yeah, yeah, see now, we could, I could do a whole techie geek talk too if you ever want, but yeah, I do now, I was just like, I like it better, I'm just gonna do it. Um, some of them are more like home movies, just, you know, because I know that those ones I, you just saw are kind of meditative and minimal and, but a lot of times what we end up shooting is, what we, what I end up shooting is something that's more, like give a home us, movie. Give us a little bit. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I am interested in that border of like home movie and intentional artwork, you know? And so. So some stuff looks like this, and I'll call it the minute movie for the day, even though it wasn't necessarily like my intentional little moment of composition. Same with this. I don't even know why I had the camera on. Hi there, welcome to Taco Bell. Go ahead once you're ready. I put that on later, but of course. You still have a seven layer burrito? I can try and recreate it for you. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I, it was one of my fan favorites. Yeah, it's been a while. I got you. I got you. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, if you can't tell, the server said that they would make one for me anyway, which, yeah. 
So just wanted to mention that, though, because I can pick out all the ones that are all like, just I feel like are nicely composed and all that. But there's, there's also going through the drive through I do that, too, you know. Um, and we dance around the house a lot. Uh, and I've started to make categories. This, we're wrapping up now. Um, we should, yeah, I'll just kind of, you know, these are just more what they look like. They're all short ones. I've started to make these categories for what they are. And stuff. You know, split screen. This comes up a lot. This composition comes up a lot. Splitting like this. You know watching people, watching water. And I think, oh, this is the last thing. This is just working with the Minute Movie stuff that has to do with water. This is something I'm doing lately. But I'm starting to get into like this kind of psychedelic stuff. You know, you know like, this is the last thing I have. where just there's other ways I can work with this material is what I'm getting excited about, about like layering it and, um, and also just literally using the database to search for something. Like I searched for water <laughs> and a thousand shots came up and some of them are water doing the dishes, some of them are water at a river, some of them are at the ocean. Um, and so I, so I'm, I'm just getting started with it. Like, how do I even use this database to make things? And this is sort of one of the first things I'm trying, you know, I've tried a couple other things, but that's the main thing. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks. I know we're a little over time. But I can talk about any of these things or anything else. Yeah. Questions into the microphone. I will bring it to you. Thank you. So in the video of the man dancing, yeah. was that non-diagenic or diagenic sound? <laughs> and was he intentionally referencing the movies where your feet moved, or was that a happy accident? Oh, I think, well, the star of that is also here, John Frentress. Thank you very much. Um, I can answer the part that it is diegetic yeah we were playing that yeah yeah it was it's diegetic is a film term for when the sound originates in the scene of the film it's not put on later you know um so yes that was what we were listening to and so i'll try to find it but i don't know john do you want to answer that one were you thinking about my dancing videos yeah well i think that song just came on the radio and it's a great song. And uh, sometimes I get happy feet. <laughs> and but Julie, I could Julie was like urging me on. Yeah. I don't know what I, I was charging my phone or something. And she's like, come on, give me some. <laughs> but you're a really good dancer. Like, the, it you. just keeps getting better, you know? Thanks a lot. Um, but yeah, I could search for dance in the archive. I have done things like that, you know. There's a whole category of dancing. Um, yeah, other thoughts about it does, it does look like your your dance moves. Maybe you're inspiring <laughs> me there. Or maybe the way it's framed, like, you know, you don't see the whole dancer and yeah, yeah. I had never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm it mm hmm Hello. Um, gosh, I haven't spoken into a microphone. Uh, I have two questions. One, does it feel different when you're working on projects individually versus collaboratively? Mm -hmm. um, and two, um, I'm really interested in, in these minute videos in the context of something like TikTok and kind of what's I going know. on right now with social media because to me, time spent on social media is like throwaway time. But watching these, it's really like rich. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm thinking about at the moment is just the way that there was a time when like 
street art was street art, but then it came into the gallery and then did it have the same meaning? And this is sort of the opposite. It's like, to me, stuff on TikTok has no meaning, but this has meaning in an like art gallery setting. Mm. And I'm just wondering if you have any kind of mm -hmm. thoughts around that topic. Well, yeah, I mean, when I was starting working with Max to make the database a year and a half ago, and we were mapping out work we're gonna do, we're gonna make the database and also do some research. Like I kept being like, there's just something with social media. I just, I need to figure out what this is. What is my relationship to that? You know, and I don't have a full answer, but I have some answers. I mean, one is that like I literally, and maybe this is, it predates 2011. Like I, I watch stuff change around me, you know, I, even though I was like carrying a camera, <laughs> you know, and doing selfies and, you know, like all this kind of stuff. Like you, I mean, video artists are often like doing all this kind of stuff before we start to see it in a more mainstream accessible way or something like that. It happens all the time. Media artists, all kinds of, like artists are often going and exploring the new thing and um, and then and later it looks like like dated or, or just, or not dated, but it looks like, oh, everyone does. Even the Julie movie. I mean, I everyone makes cut up videos now, remix videos now. And so uh, that are like that, that are like, I'm going to find all, people use computers to do it probably like right <laughs> you know like you don't need to sit and edit every single frame the way I am and stuff so um, so there's something there I mean there's a way that a big difference I think is that this is very slow cinema kind of <laughs> like like that social media is very fast it's often made fast it's put up fast it's consumed fast and we move on to the next thing it's literally so fast like instant scrolled through and all that stuff whereas this is definitely has been and continues to be the opposite it's about it's still about slowing my life down you know and um like I showed you little clips, but actually they're much longer. And as I think about how to work with all this material and edit it, that's a big thing I think about is like, how much do I want to be true to what that duration felt like? You know, just like the thing I showed you in the very beginning, that dancing thing, like what, what is the truth of this? Is it like showing you what a dance, how long it was, or is it editing it to feel like, the, I don't know. And so I'm still grappling with like questions like that. And so, um, which are kind of about experience and then translating that for someone else. It's kind of like, Poetry 101 or something, you know, and so, so yeah, but definitely the slowing down, like this whole pro this process is so slow, like it's taking me years and years to. There's there's a lot of content in it, you know, like there's there's all this aesthetic stuff and there's all this personal, and I want to figure out how you bring in the rest of the world, you know, these aren't happening on their own. There's a whole big world. There's you know, uh, people getting elected and there's, you know, all kinds of stuff happening outside this that I'm often involved with in other ways. But um, so that would be one thing, fast, slow. But yeah, I mean, some, maybe that's why I haven't gone to TikTok because sometimes I'm like, it feels too, like, I don't know if I want to see that. Like stuff that I felt like I've worked on forever is like now just like a thing, all these um, filters and stuff or whatever, but, or ways people edit stuff. I like it. It's fun. I like seeing people play with media, you know? Um, but I do think it can also be a tool to make you more present is how I use it. Not less, not distracted, actually even more here with us, make us see more. And later too, in reflection, like, oh, I didn't know that X, Y, Z was actually going on. Like it's documentation. Um, so thanks for asking. I guess there, I have ideas already about the differences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One yeah. more question. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Julie. I'm Janine. Um, I just wanted to ask what your interest um, sparked in recording things around you in your everyday life and when that kind of translated to you using yourself to relate to those experiences. When, well, I, yeah, I mean, that was the like high school thing. Like, yeah. Another big through line here that's like not mentioned is sort of, you know, personal emotional growth and healing. You know, I mean, I'm one of those people who was sort of you know, saved by the library. And so, you know, like just that there were books connecting me to the outside world was a big deal. And so, um, and lives that were different from the one I was growing up in. And so, um, so I say that to be like, you know, some people take 
some kids, like I was like a teenager when I started playing around with cameras, it will draw or write or, you know, find their ways of like self-expressing things that they can't express in, you know, in where they are. And so I feel like I just, it's of the time that that's what the tool I stumbled upon, you know? <laughs> and so I did like draw and write and stuff too as a kid, but um, I got really into that. And so, so the high school videos are kind of lost, I think, you know, but they're filled with that kind of stuff too. So it's sort of both a way to connect. I mean, in a way it's like connecting with myself, you know, like, especially if there are reasons you know, I felt disconnected from myself, you know? And so that's a whole nother talk. I mean, that's the next level, you know, that I'm not sure how to talk about with the public audience. Like I talk about all the time with my friends or like, blah, 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 my personal healing and you know all this stuff and so but I just haven't but but the younger generation is better at talking about this publicly and I'm glad thank you you're helping me out and so um but I think there's really just something like that I mean the why is probably like it was a way to like see like connect like to the world and you know you you all are familiar with things like dissociation you know I mean I feel like for me it was a lot of that it wasn't a teacher saying do the you know I mean it came from a sort of more organic place like that. And I honestly, I can s talk about it like this, even though I don't know for sure that that's what little Jules was thinking, you know? I think she just wanted to have a good time, finally. <laughs> and so, um, but, uh, but it is still what it is for me, you know? Like it's, like, and I've noticed with the iPhone, part of the reason I want to switch away from iPhone is I can feel that, you know, I'm, I'll go, I'll use a phone to, I'll see something beautiful and pull a phone out and I'm trying to connect with that present moment with me and whatever I'm shooting. And like a text comes up from a wonderful person saying, let's hang out, you know, <laughs> but, but it is interrupting what like I was uh, just in, you know, and so, uh, and then I, and I can feel the energy I'm bringing to that. Sometimes I get a little disappointed or annoyed, you know, and so, but it's all part of that process. It's still good to even notice all that stuff I'm feeling as someone who, yeah, grew up not knowing what I was feeling. It took a long time um, to, defrost and all that kind of stuff. So I'm totally like midlife revolution story. Someday I'll tell you more about all that. Next time, bring me back for the encore and we can talk about it. But I do appreciate that. And I would really like to figure out how to talk about that kind of stuff. And I felt like you had a second question. You're um, like, why did you, you do it? Answered it? No, just like how you use yourself. And but you said as a way of connecting to yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, and feeling like, like I'm saying, it was, it's cool to look at that list of feelings and most of them really are about feeling joyful and things like that. You know, it's like, it's like a mindfulness practice is kind of what it's become for real too, um, which I didn't intend, but that is certainly what has happened, you know, so that's, <laughs> thank you. Thank you but, very much. <laughs> um, yeah, so. And I'm an alumni. I went to UB for my undergrad. You look familiar. I'm from Buffalo. So yeah. Oh, let's talk we'll about talk that. later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent four years in Buffalo, New York. Yeah, I spent like 30 years around New York State before coming out here. But yeah, if, if anyone has anything else you want to ask about, otherwise we could Great. do something else. Um, similar to what's inspiring you when you go to the hot springs, thinking about the small organisms, um, but outside your da database um, exploration, is there anything specific right now that um, you're very intrigued by that you're exploring? Oh. <laughs> well, what's that? <laughs> I'm very inspired by our dogs, yeah. <laughs> um, it's true, it's true. Yeah, oh yeah, I feel like, um, well, I'll say one, per one personal thing. I mean, I'm getting married to a wonderful person this summer at a wedding, and I am very inspired by the wedding ritual, you know? Like, I am like, whoa, I love feeling like we're gathering all these loved ones to us, and uh, we're preparing for months, like, I'm really into it. It's kind of connecting me back to just an interest I used to have in grad school about just ritual in general, you know? And so so that's really something I'm really into right now. Um, I mean, I'm kind of obsessed with a lot of writers. Like, there's a whole other creative writing thing bubbling up here that I haven't really talked about because most of it is just ideas and stuff. But um, 
so like Annie or No, who I mentioned, I'm really into her writing. Um, she writes in a very diaristic way, and so it's really exciting to see a writer um, also doing this, like like accumulating notes and observing her daily life, and then figuring out how to translate sometimes very intense experiences of loss and um, you know difficulty. Uh, in a way that is um, now sort of a gift for someone else, not like, you know, that some might help someone else, actually. And so, so her, um, I don't know, I'm obsessed with a lot of things, uh, but, I, but I'm blanking on them all right now, of course, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I read a lot, is one thing I'll say. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much.